Welcome to the 23rd International C. Elegance Hello. Conference. Anywhere and everywhere, redesigned and reimagined. The first and hopefully only ever fully virtual international world meeting. I'm Barbara Conrad from University College London. And I'm Kelly Sangupta from Brandeis University in the US. And we are the co-organizers of this meeting. Before we start on the science, we would like to give you some general information about this virtual meeting and say thank you to a number of people. Next slide, please. A big thank you to our sponsors who have generously contributed to the costs associated with running a virtual platform, providing registration awards and sponsoring workshops and professional development sessions. Please be sure to attend their virtual exhibits and workshops during the meeting. Next slide. We are very pleased to report that we have a record number of attendees with 70% being trainees. We are also really happy that the Genetics Society of America was able to provide 125 registration awards to participants from developing countries. Next slide. So a major advantage of this meeting being virtual is that we have participation from across the globe. Um, so there are 45 countries that are participating in this meeting, including 10 countries who've never been represented before at IWM. Next slide, please. So the last year, uh, needless to say, has been challenging for everyone, um, but professionally, it's been particularly difficult for early career researchers. So in organizing this meeting, Barbara and I chose to focus this meeting on ECRs and also mid-career researchers who represent the future of our field. So the entire organizing committee is comprised of ECRs. There's gonna be um, an anchor talk in each session, uh, in each of the parallel sessions by an ECR. The keynotes in this plenary session today are given by three terrific mid-career researchers. And I'm delighted to report there are gonna be two talks by undergrads and then 51 of the posters are gonna be from undergrads as well. Uh, next slide, please. So a huge thank you to our amazing organizing committee, which is comprised of ECRs from across the world, as you can see here. And so we're very grateful for their efforts in selecting the talks and also their input in the program uh, of the meeting. Uh, next slide. And many thanks also to the advisory committee and the poster award organizers. There's actually a total of um, uh, 1,101 posters that are, uh, you're gonna be seeing. And so the organizing the poster award has been a very big job. Next slide, please. As Piali just mentioned, the keynote speakers of the opening plenary sessions are three terrific mid-career scientists. Luisa Coachella from the IMP in Vienna, Odette Ricciabi from Tel Aviv University and Emily Trammell from the University of California, San Diego. And I very much look forward to their talks. Next slide, please. Oh, got it already. We wanted to take advantage of the virtual format to do something different to close the meeting. The closing plenary session will be a panel that will discuss the past, present and future of our field and will bring together researchers from different career stages and from different parts of the world, including Nobel laureates. The panel will discuss questions that were submitted by participants in advance, and there will be an opportunity to submit questions also during the panel. The panel will be moderated by Julie Arringer from the University of Cambridge and Nidhi Bala from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Next slide, please. Well, that's not all, folks. Um, so Anascope brings back the very popular um, warm art show. As I mentioned before, there are going to be poster awards. And we are absolutely delighted to report that Morris Maduro and Curtis Lohr agreed to come out of retirement and run the incredibly popular and always entertaining warm show again. Uh, next slide, please. So and a very important reminder to all of you, all attendees, so everyone is expected to abide by the GSA code of conduct which we strongly encourage you to read in its entirety. And if there are any problems that arise during the meeting, please report them at this uh, website. Uh, next slide. So reminder to all of you that we have multiple platforms today, for, or not today, this whole week for different events. Um, the conference app will provide you access to all of these events. So um, Zoom for talks, Remo for posters and socials, 
And you can also connect with others via Slack. Next slide, please. Last but not least, Piali and I are very grateful to the GSA for their long running support of this meeting and their amazing staff and particularly Anne-Marie Mahoney and for all their tireless work on this meeting. Thank you very, very much. And with this, I'm handing over to Jane Hubbard from New York University, Vice President of the GSA and President of Rumbold. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, as Barbara mentioned, I am the, I'm Jane Hubbard. I'm the 2021 Vice President and the 2022 President of the Genetic Society of America. And I'm a longstanding C. Elgin's researcher. I'm delighted to welcome you all today. If you're not already a GSA member, I invite you to join. GSA is an international membership organization for anyone who uses the tools of genetics and genomics in their research. We have almost 6,000 members from more than 50 countries at all career stages. And as well as hosting community conferences like this one, we advocate for science and scientists, provide professional development programs and awards, and publish two highly regarded journals, Genetics and G3. A quick reminder that you can meet some of our editors at the publishing workshop tomorrow. I'd also like to recommend that you consider, um, yeah, if we could go back one slide, please, thank you. I'd also like to recommend that you consider attending a terrific GSA webinar series organized by the current GSA president, Hugo Bellin, that starts next week. These events aim to introduce opportunities for exploring gene function across humans and model organisms and provide tips and tutorials to help with useful websites and databases. Um, on behalf of GSA, I'd also like to thank the entire organizing committee led by Barbara and Piali for their outstanding service and willingness to take on a big job in a challenging context. Thank you all for your time, your dedication, and your creativity. And I'd like to acknowledge several of GSA's early career leaders who volunteered to help organize professional development events. The early career leaders are a wonderful group of students and postdocs who work together to address unmet needs for early career scientists. You may have already attended some of their online workshops or read their career interviews and blog posts. If you're an early career member, you receive an email newsletter from them every Friday with resources, jobs, and opportunities. Thank you also to GSA's Equity and Inclusion Committee who are helping to guide the society's efforts to address systemic racism and injustice in our field. I know you'll all join me at tomorrow's plenary session where we'll learn about important work in this area. Now I'm excited to talk about the future when hopefully we'll be able to see each other again in person. In addition to warm meetings in 2022 and 2023, stay tuned for information on these. I hope to see you all in 2024, March 5th to 10th at TAGC, the Allied Genetics Conference, which will be held at National Harbor in the Washington DC area. TAGC is a once every four years unique kind of conference designed to bring together many different research communities and foster new collaborations and connections. It includes researchers working on worms, flies, yeast, mouse, as well as population, evolutionary and quantitative genetics and more. As many of you know, the in-person TAGC 2020 had to be canceled last year, but GSA put together and held in record time an incredibly successful and inspiring online TAGC instead. It was an amazing demonstration of community spirit and accomplishment. So now switching my hats for a moment as departing president of the International C. Elgin's board, also known as Worm Board, I wanna thank the many people who helped our community navigate the many twists and turns of the last two years. We have a new charter, a new organization of representatives, several exciting initiatives underway. Special thanks to Paul Sternberg and the Worm Base team, especially Todd Harris for helping disseminate information through the Worm Base blog post. I wanna thank other departing representatives for their past service um, here in the little green boxes, as well as those who are continuing to serve and those newly elected this month, you'll see on the right. I especially thank Maureen Barr who will be taking over as president. If you're not sure about what Worm Board does for our community, check out the link or just search Worm Base News Blog for Worm Board, or you can even Google Worm Base Worm Board and, and you'll find it there. There are many opportunities for community members to become involved in addition to getting involved in GSA. So I encourage you to reach out to your board representatives. So whatever new twists and turns the next few years may hold, I am looking forward to all the good things that will come from our resilient and evolving worm research community. 
So one final thanks to all of you out there watching and participating in this meeting from all over the world. Even if this year we're attending from our labs and our living rooms, thank you for showing up and keeping this meeting and our community vibrant. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jean, so much. Uh, our next up is Anne Rugby from the University of Minnesota to talk about our favorite institution, the CDC. Sorry about that. Here we go. Okay, it's really a pleasure to be back together with all of you again. Um, as you know, in the CGC, our main goal is to collect and distribute useful C. elegans strains and get them to you as quickly as possible so you can make quick breakthroughs in your research. We also have a small community-driven microRNA deletion project, which you can learn more about um, at our poster 501C. As um, director of the CGC, I have sort of a unique um, view of the state of the C. elegans field. And I thought I'd share with you the CGC view of the impact of the pandemic. Two years ago at this meeting, we reported a record number of strains distributed, oh, well over 31,000. Unfortunately, 2020 was not so pretty. We were forced to shut down um, for nearly eight weeks. We reopened as quickly as we could on May 16th, and I think um, recovered, rebounded fairly quickly. But still in the end, in 2020, we sent out just less than 21,000 strains, the lowest number in over a decade since 2009. 2021 is starting out a bit better as you can see here. And we're really hoping the research presented at this meeting spurs you all to order more strains from us because we really like being back up above the 2,500 strain um, per month level. You've all been busy. Our top 10 labs all ordered hundreds of strains from us this year. The top award goes to the Tang Lab at Westlake Institute in China, who ordered nearly a thousand strains since the last war meeting. But we don't just um, send strains, we also collect strains. We've recently surpassed the 23,000 mark. And I would like to take this opportunity to pay a really special tribute to Don Mormon who I think is really one of the great leaders of the C. elegans field. And he truly exemplifies the community-minded spirit on which our field was founded. And who has um, just recently quietly retired. Don has made numerous and diverse contributions to the field beautiful studies on muscle development, structure, and function. He co-discovered active TC1 elements and their use in transposon tagging. With Andy Fire, he discovered antisense RNA in C. elegans, a prelude to what we know as RNAi. He established genome-scale gene expression um, profiling studies. And most importantly to the CGC, he established and directed the Vancouver Knockout Facility. Together um, with Knockout Consortium Labs of Bob Barstead and Shohei Matani, they've made all of the thousands, tens of thousands single gene knockouts that we all know and love. And then with, the, with Bob Waterston, he um, initiated the Million Mutations Project, and he convinced me to take the over 2,000 strains that this project um, generated. And that results um, in this jump in strains in the CGC here. And it was really smart of him to convince me to take those um, because we've sent them out over 13,000 times. And this is just a small fraction of what Don means to the CGC and all of us. If you add in his knockout strains, other strains and other projects, a full 29.2% of the CGC collection is thanks to Don. 
And by my count, we've shipped his strains more than 91,000 times. And Don would be the first to tell you that he didn't do this alone. His lab sent me um, this reunion picture of part of the knockout gang who were instrumental um, in generation of these um, reagents. So I asked Don, what's he gonna do now? And he says he wants to return to his roots. And I think that means make lots of music. And I'm hoping maybe in a future worm meeting, we'll get Don and his band to come and play for the dance back when we're all together again. And now if we were at UCLA, I would ask you all to rise and join me in a standing ovation to recognize Don's great accomplishments. It would look something like this, but instead we're virtual. So it's gonna look like this. And I want to encourage you all, whether you've just joined the C. elegans field or you're a contemporary of Don or you're somewhere in between, please send your thanks to Don. Tell him what you've done with his strains, send him a picture, thank him for all he's done. Um, and I'm gonna end um, there by saying Don, the CGC misses you already. Thank you. And young people in the audience, make sure to post this on all those appropriate social media accounts that I know nothing about. Thank you so much, and that was wonderful. That was really great. Um, quite a number of strains, I'm impressed. Um, next is now Paul Sternberg from Caltech, who will give us an update on worm base and micropublication. Hello, everybody. I can almost imagine the the Royce Hall um, or whatever other new venue we'll have. Okay, so um, in addition to the CGC, worm base is a is a important part of all of our lives. For some of it, it's daily, or you know, even more than that. So I want to give you an update on worm base and related topics. So if you want, if you're new to the field and you want to learn about how to use worm base, come to this workshop tomorrow. And if you already are in the field and use Warm Base and you want to get tuned up or learn about new features and ask questions, come to the workshop tomorrow. So everybody should come to the workshop tomorrow or, or, and pay attention. We also have a poster on um, single cell RNA seq tools by Eduardo Del, the Vega Beltram. Uh, it's 498C. So you can learn about Warm Base. Okay, I, I have to say that Warm Base funding is, is being cut to what will be 50% of the 2012 level by next year. That's not, so not accounting inflation, that's more than, you know, it's less than 50% of the act, you know, action that we had 10 years ago. So this is a problem. And we expect that the website and portal generated by the Alliance of Genome Resources, which is separately funded and is a collaboration of many of the research organism knowledge bases like Flybase, Yeast, ZFIN, et cetera. Um, and, and this will, I think, Part, you know, partially make up for this decrease. And this and the and the alliance actually is quite good and in some ways is going to be better for more base to start because you come in with one, it's one stop shopping for genes. So if you come in with you hear a fly, about a fly gene or a yeast gene or a human gene, you can go to the alliance website, type it in. Um, in this case, you you get the human gene and you can uh, from that human gene page, you can get to the worm gene, LA23, but you also get these comparative views of harmonized data that the curators, the bio curators of all these organi organizations have worked together to get into one place and made it digestible. So for example, for gene ontology annotations, you can get that for all the, your favorite gene and its orthologs if they exist or gene expression, um, et cetera. So that's already an advantage. So over the next couple of years, there's gonna be this transition from worm-based infrastructure to the Alliance infrastructure. We're trying to make it, and we think we can do it, make it as seamless as possible, um, but please pay attention about features that you really care about. And you might be the one in, in 5,000 people who, who, are, who care about it. You have to speak up. Okay, we still need help because the Alliance is not gonna do everything. So a few things we need you to do. Cite Wormbase or eventually, or the Alliance in the acknowledgements 
or reference what will be next year, uh, genet an annual genetics paper on these resources that describe updates and what's going on. And when you're writing papers, which is always good for reproducibility, say exactly what sequences, strains, and alleles you use. So if you have a mutation, 30 base flanks on each side is important so we can map it to the genome. That's true for any organism. So if you leave worms and go up to human genetics, do the same thing. Um, we're gonna try to get through the Alliance, now that we have this coalition of different model organisms, to obtain funding for curation and software development efforts in different countries. So we'll be reaching out to um, researchers in different countries, in this case, worms, to help, help put together some, some nodes so that we can have, make this truly a, a worldwide effort. Uh, then finally, if, if you, uh, as you, you probably know, when you publish a paper, you get this author form, you get an email from Wormbase asking you, congratulations on the publication of your paper, uh, tell us what's in it. Now, the way this works is we actually get your paper, use artificial intelligence and machine learning, and we text mine information for your paper and present it back to you to see if it's true. And we're gradually developing that. Okay, so that's, so try to make it as easy as possible for you to do this, um, which along with the being explicit about sequences and strains and alleles will really help get information into the knowledge base quickly. Now, if you think about it though, it's a little weird. The papers, you know, you're the expert and, and now you're getting asked months, probably a year later from writing the paper, to, to remember what's in it, right? And the computer's thinking about it. It would, be, it would really be better if you, if you just put that information as, as you published. So the journals, after 20 years, we realized that the journals just aren't helping in general, aren't helping us uh, get this task done. Genetics and G3 being the minor exception. So uh, Warm-Based Biocurators and, and Tim Shadle and, and I, we started this micropublication project, many of you have heard about, to get better scholarly communication. So the goals are get data and knowledge into the knowledge bases as part of publication and explore how that can be done. Um, capture knowledge that never gets published, which we have estimated about 50%, um, you know, reagents, knockouts that never went there, expression patterns, then you can publish that. And more generally, and the aspirational goal is to make writing and reviewing and reading just more fun again. Okay, what are the subjects of micropublications? The micropublications are units of intellectual content that describe you know, an experiment or a, a related set of experiments. This could be protein localization, cell function, you, know, you kill a cell or, or optogenetically change it, um, gene, uh, gene function, so what's the phenotype, um, genotypes, you know, here's, we, we made a, a knockout or a certain allele of this gene, here it is, methods like genome engineering and protein engineering and so on, and even negative results, software, and especially as we're coming into the summer, one thing you think about is in a lot of cases in a 10 week project, an undergrad or high school student can get a nice piece of reproducible data that could get out, right? So these are things that, that get left out. Now here's a kind of more extreme example. Paul Miner who completed his thesis in my lab, I don't know, six or seven years ago. Now um, there was a chapter four that was gonna get published and the last couple experiments never got done. So eventually, he wrote a set of five linked micro publications that are, you know, each one sort of like a section of a paper. So he got this information out on uh, that some people cared about. Okay, the status now is, um, okay, first of all, you can go to the website micropublication.org or just Google micropublication, you'll get it. Uh, we published 337 papers, uh, two thirds of which are C. elegans, and there's an increasing number of other organisms as other communities try to um, use this platform. Uh, the turnaround time is quite good. I, I think uh, the record is less than less than two days, including re -re -re revisions and a re-review. But it really just depends on how fast everybody is. Um, and you know, the good news is it's indexed in, in it's indexed in PubMed Central, so it's, it goes seamlessly into grants and grant reports, and they're searchable in PubMed. The only missing indexing service that we're, we've applied for and are waiting to hear from is Web of Science so that the citations start um, counting heavily. Okay, so um, I, I wanna finish by saying, besides thanking Wormbase for making it really fun to work with them and, and helping us all out. Um, I wanna thank the hundreds of reviewers and authors of micropublication and the Worm Science officers who are editors, Andy Golden, Kathy Savage-Dunn, Yishi Jin, 
Tim Shadle, um, and soon Cheryl Van Buskirk. And as we expand, if that happens, we'll um, ask more of you to, to join in the effort. And strikingly, more than 5% of C. elegans publications in the last two years were published in micropublication biology. And we had no, you know, we, this is just mind boggling to us. What that tells us is that these are, these are papers that weren't going to, that information that wasn't going to get published elsewhere. So if we all publish micropublications on the years that we don't publish other papers, we can double or, or more the number of C. elegans papers. And that'll start, you know, getting the word about C. elegans out, out into the world. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for everything you do for Wormbase. And I'm a huge fan of microbiology publications. So I encourage all of you to check it out and also submit to it. OK, um, so next up, we are very excited for our three fantastic plenary speakers today. Um, so each of them is going to have uh, 20 minutes. And there's going to be about three minutes of Q&A after each talk. So I encourage all of you to put in your questions in the Q&A box. And then uh, Barbara and I will um, read out some of the questions. Of course, three minutes is not going to be enough to get to all your questions. So, but the speakers will continue to answer questions um, um, in that box. And I also want to remind you that there's going to be a 15 minute session at the very end uh, where the three speakers will, um, uh, will be present and they will, they will also um, uh, continue to ask, uh, answer questions during that time. So first up is the amazing Luisa Coachella from IMT Vienna. And in keeping with the theme of the meeting, she's going to be introduced by a graduate student from her lab, Emilio Manuel Santishan. Take it away, Emilio. Yes. So thank you, Piali. And uh, hi, everybody. It's for me an honor to introduce my mentor, Luisa Cochella, at this meeting. So let me tell you a bit of her background first. Uh, Luisa studied biology as an undergrad in the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. And she then moved to Johns Hopkins School of Medicine for her PhD at Rachel Green's lab. And there she received the Alicia Reynolds Research Award, which honors outstanding PhD students. But it was only after joining Oliver Howard's lab for her postdoc that she started working with the worm. And in 2013, she started her own lab in the IMP in Vienna, focusing on gene regulatory principles that drive the diversification of cell types, with a particular focus uh, in microRNA function. And she was awarded with an ERC starting grant in 2014, and she has been an envoy young investigator since 2018. And this year, in one week, to be precise, she's moving her entire lab to Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, including me and two other PhD students. And I can tell you that a lot of people are really sad that Luis is leaving here in the Vienna Valley Center because everyone truly values Luis's input during seminars and meetings. And this also includes PhD students. And I'm saying this because I haven't seen a single person that is chosen so often to be part of thesis advisory committees. And the, re the reason behind that is that besides being a very good scientist, Luis is also a very nice person. And personally, I immediately felt a really nice vibe from Luisa when I was interviewing for her. And there was a moment I always remember right at the very start of my PhD, I needed to screen 20 big plates of worms for a forward genetic screens, and this was on a Saturday. And Luisa actually joined and helped me with the screen and all of this while we were listening to very nice Argentinian rock. And to me, this said a lot about who she is as a person, the fact that she would spend time of her weekend to help a new student. So with that said, Luisa is going to talk to us about the roles of microRNAs during C. elegans development. And uh, the Zoom is yours, Luisa. Wow, thank you very much, Emilio, for that very, very kind introduction. I'm, um, yeah, <laughs> we'll talk later, but thank you. <laughs> so, um, yes, as Emilio said, uh, well, and, and first of all, before I start also, thank you, Piali and Barbara, for the opportunity to present our work. I think it's, uh, it, it's really much appreciated by all of us middle career scientists, although that middle career thing really hit a nerve. <laughs> so, um, in my lab, as Emilio mentioned, we're interested in the gene regulatory principles that drive the production of multicellular organisms. And there's one particular aspect of gene regulation that I would like to discuss with you today, and that is repression. 
And um, repression is fascinating for a number of reasons. Jacques Bonnot called it one of the secrets of life. And that's because without repression, it's impossible to generate specificity in biology. Repressors are necessary to impose spatial and temporal specificity, and also the correct dynamics of change that are required for any biochemical process. Now, among repressors, we're interested in a very large class of post-transcriptional repressors called micronase. And this audience should uh, very well know that micronase were first discovered in C. elegans by the Ambrose and and Brevkin labs. And uh, these um, short non-coding RNAs actually direct a silencing machinery to the three permutiars of mRNAs and thereby repress their, um, their expression. Now, uh, one of the reasons why we got interested in micronase and, and the roles in, in development is because for every animal that has been studied, micronase are essential for development. And these can be assessed by genetically blocking either the production or the function of micronase at different steps in this pathway. And here I'm showing you what happens to C. elegans embryos when they are completely devoid of micronase by blocking um, or by depleting the microprocessor composed of Rosha and Pasha. So while micronase are essential for development, we also very well know uh, what they are required for during larval development from work on LIM4 and, and LED7. Um, out of the roughly 150 microRNAs present in C. elegans, we know what really just a handful do. And so we wanted to take a more global view to understand what is the contribution of microRNA of micronase to development. And in order to do that, we first took a fresh view at when and where micronase are expressed. And that is because obviously that will uh, really strongly determine what is the potential function of these micronase. Take, for example, these two extreme examples, MIR35, very broadly expressed early in embryogenesis. And as you might expect, this microRNA uh, actually plays a role in early embryonic development. On the other extreme, we have a microRNA like Lausy6, which is expressed in a single post-mitotic neuron. So this microRNA also, as one might expect, is able to function only within this context, but within this cell, it has a very important function. And that is the, uh, that it determines the identity of these particular sensor neuron, the left AAC. So to gain, a, again, a broader view um, on when and where microRNAs are expressed, we uh, superimposed these patterns on small RNA sequencing data that we, uh, so microRNA sequencing uh, data that we obtained from either whole embryos or whole larvae. And what you, what you can see here is those microRNAs ranked by abundance. Now, of course, a microRNA like MIR35 that is broadly expressed is at the top of this distribution, while LAUSI6, which is very abundant, but only within one cell out of the whole embryo, falls at the bottom of this list. In fact, all of the most abundant micronase in the embryo are part of just two microRNA families. These are groups of micronase that share targeting specificity. And all of these block of very abundant micronase you see here belong to either the MIR35 or the MIR51 families expressed uh, in, in the embryo. What you can also see is that the vast majority of micronase seem relatively lowly expressed, but I have just uh, as I have just shown you for lousy 6 this could actually mean that many of these microRNAs are expressed with very high cell type specificity. And so we generated FOSMIP reporters for about a third of all uh, microRNAs with a, with a strong uh, bias for, for these relatively lowly abundant microRNAs. And these actually complemented um, microRNA expression analysis done by the Walhout and Ambrose labs already several years ago. And what we can see is that a large fraction of microRNAs is actually expressed with extremely high cell type specificity. So we think this highlights that there are two broad classes of microRNAs that could, of course, contribute very different um, regulatory functions to the developing animal. As you can expect, microRNAs that are expressed broadly and early during embryogenesis might help coordinate events that need to happen across multiple cells in the embryo early on. However, all of these much more highly specific microRNAs are uh, probably not playing a role early in embryogenesis, but rather provide these very different specialized cells with unique properties. And that's what I'm going to um, go a little bit deeper in for the rest of my talk. So let me spend a few minutes talking about these very um, highly expressed, abundant, broadly expressed early microRNAs. Now, work from uh, the Horvitz and the Miska labs had shown already that these two microRNAs are essential for embryonic development. 
deletion of the eight family members that compose the MIR-35 family causes embryonic arrest towards the end of gastrulation, beginning of, uh, of elongation, and deletion of all six family members of the, of the MIR-51 family causes uh, problems a little bit later in embryogenesis, mostly during elongation. Now, uh, within each of these families, all members are functionally redundant as the, these full deletions can be rescued by transgenic expression of the respective individual family members. Given what I just showed you about the uh, overall distribution of expression of micronase the, and, and the unique abundance and, and uh, broadly expressed nature of MIR-35 and MIR-51 relative to all other micronase, we wondered if it could be that these are the two only micronase that are actually necessary for the animal to undergo embryogenesis and, and produce a morphologically normal larva. Or in other words, whether these two micronase are sufficient to produce um, a viable larva. And so this is uh, the question that Philip Dexheimer, a student that recently graduated from the lab set out to answer. And Philip set out an experiment to address this, uh, which is the following. He managed to create um, embryos that are practically devoid of micronase by very stringently depleting the microprocessor composed of Drosha and Pasha. And he did that in two ways. First, he used RNA, uh, sorry, um, oxygen inducible degrons on both Drosha and Pasha together with RNAi, and that caused um, embryos to arrest, as, as we have seen before. But he also, in parallel, used a temperature sensitive allele of Pasha that had been isolated in the MISCA lab. Now, to these embryos that were practically depleted of microRNAs, he then added back MIR35 and MIR51 via the Mirtron pathway. And in this pathway, uh, microRNA precursors are uh, provided as introns that then get excised by the spliceosome, thereby uh, bypassing the requirement for the microprocessor. So when Philip added back these two Mirtrons to animals that had been depleted of micronase, he saw that actually this is enough to turn these really malformed embryos into pretty nice looking L ones. And even those animals that did not make it to hatching, which is what we're what we're scoring here, uh, they were significantly better than in the absence of micronase at all. And we think that this difference is due to the imperfect uh, expression of our Mirtron 51 transgene. But so what this told us is that it seems like Mir 35 and Mir 51 families are um, sufficient to get C. elegans through embryogenesis and produce a morphologically normal larva. Now, I wish I could tell you more about what these two micronate families do. Unfortunately, I don't have very good answers for you yet. What I can tell you is that the MIR-35 MIR family regulates apoptosis both in the embryo and in the germline. And we know these from work from the Conrad lab, from the dairy and McJunkin labs as well. However, this function of MIR-35 is not sufficient to explain the fully penetrant lethality in the absence of this microRNA. Now, we have been more interested in understanding the role of the MIR-51 family, and that is because MIR-51 is a descendant of the most ancient animal microRNA. MIR-51 is the homologue of MIR-100, which was already present at the base of all metazoans. And we have made quite some progress in uh, understanding MIR-51 function, and Emilio will tell you all about that at his poster later today. But I do want to highlight one aspect of his work that I find particularly exciting. And that is that by playing with the number of microRNA family members that he has in a strain and measuring precisely the amount of microRNA uh, present in those animals, Emilio has been able to generate an in vivo titration of this microRNA family. And in doing so, he has uncovered a dose-dependent phenotype, namely the length of the worms correlates with the abundance of this microRNA family. And he has uncovered dose-dependent target regulation as well. So I'm really excited about this because I think that in addition to uh, hopefully soon teasing out the function of this highly conserved microRNA, we now have a really good handle to address the somewhat neglected quantitative aspects of microRNA mediated repression in vivo. So going back to this view, MIR35 and MIR51 families clearly play a really important role in embryogenesis in C. elegans. However, 
by no means I want, uh, I want to leave you with the idea that these other microRNAs are any less interesting or important. In fact, we think that these highly cell type specific microRNAs contribute very important uh, to very important aspects of the uh, unique requirements of specialized cells. And I will try to highlight this point by telling you a quick story about a muscle specific microRNA that was developed by Paula Gutierrez Perez, also a student that recently graduated from our lab. So MIR-1 is muscle specific in every animal where it's been studied. Uh, in C. elegans, it's expressed in pharyngeal and body wall muscles, in other animals, in skeletal and cardiac muscle. It's also uh, uniquely conserved in its sequence. It's conserved in the seed sequence, which is the main driver for targeting, but also beyond. And it's also conserved in its function in muscle. MIR-1 is required for proper cell biology and physiology of muscle cells in every animal where it's been studied. However, despite this high degree of conservation, they, may, there's many different targets that have been attributed to MIR-1, but these are by and large not conserved. And so we decided to um, take a closer look into this, in particular, given the very striking observation that MIR-1 is predicted to target multiple subunits of the vacular ATPase complex across very, very distant animals. As you can see here, highlighted in red are all the predicted MIR-1 targets. So out of these roughly 15 uh, subunit complex, all of them are uh, essentially targeted in C. elegans and large numbers of them in, in different animals. Now, uh, the let's say the, the probability that this happens by chance is practically zero. And so we, we thought this needed to be followed up. Moreover, what the VATPase is doing is it's pumping protons using the energy from ATP to acidify the lumen of lysosomes and other um, endosomal compartments. And because of this function, uh, the VATPase is important for lysosomal degradation, for autophagy, for endocytosis and exocytosis, and it's also a hub for metabolic signaling, for example, uh, through the mTOR pathway. And given this very central role in cell biology, we thought that deregulation of the VATPase in the in mere one mutant animals could explain the very diverse um, phenotypes or, or defects that occur in muscles that lack mere one. Now, before I go on and tell you more about the VATPAs, I would like to highlight at this point that there are two other conserved targets of MIR-1, DCT1 and TBC7. Now, TBC7 has, uh, is also, um, uh, also plays a role in autophagy and has recently been implicated by the Pocock lab as a MIR-1 target. We think that together, all of these, uh, all of these targets form a regulon of MIR-1 um, or a MIR-1 dependent regulon that controls a common cell biology. However, we think the VATPase is the centerpiece of, of this regulon and it has also led us to identify a really interesting mechanism, I think. So I will tell you a little bit more about that. So um, the first thing that Paula did uh, was to see if the VATPase of units are actually deregulated or derepressed in the absence of MIR-1. And for that, she profiled muscles isolated from wild type or MIR-1 mutant embryos. And as you can see, multiple VHA transcripts that code for VATPase of units are upregulated. Now, the question is whether this upregulation is actually functionally meaningful. Does, uh, does it have an impact in, um, in muscle cells? And so for that, Paula set up a number of different quantitative assays. I will show you just two of them. One of them is uh, she looked at a mitochondrially localized GFP reporter. And what you can observe is that in mere one deficient animals, mitochondria are highly fragmented. And she quantified this in two independent alleles of mere one, including one uh, precise deletion that we have generated. Uh, in a different assay, Paula looked at the segregation prone uh, reporter, which Wild type animals can sort of deal with, but mere one animals have really uh, trouble um, getting rid of these um, of these aggregates, as you can see here, also quantified in um, in this plot below. Now, with these assays in hand, Paula could ask whether the VATPase is a meaningful target of mere one. And their reasoning is the following. If in the absence of MIR-1, it is upregulation of VATPase subunits that causes these phenotypes, then in a wild type MIR-1 animal, if we remove the MIR-1 binding sites from these uh, VHA transcripts, we should be able to phenocopy the loss of MIR-1. And Paula chose a set of six VHA transcripts 
uh, because they are conserved targets of MIR1 throughout all animals. And she mutated the MIR1 binding sites in all of these. And what she observed when she did that is that that causes the same phenotypes as loss of MIR1, very strongly indicating that the MIR1 mediated repression of the VATPAs is essential, or of VATPA subunits, is essential for muscle homeostasis, for muscle cell homeostasis. So why could that be? There's two possibilities. One is that if these subunits are somehow uh, limiting, so that if there's one or few subunits that are limiting for VATPA's uh, complex assembly, then when these are upregulated in the absence of MIR1, they could lead to production of more complex, and that could cause gain of function defects. On the other hand, the upregulation of individual subunits, either due to levels or changes in stoichiometry, could lead to aberrant interactions and ultimately reduced uh, or lower production of functional VATPase complex. So Paula did a lot of genetic tests that led us to lean towards this model, but I will show you two quick experiments that I think really show that this is the case. And the first one is, of course, to look at the pH of the lysosomes, because that's the main function of the VATPase, to acidify lysosomes. So for that, Paula expressed a pH sensor in lysosomes, and the fluorescence of the sensor is quenched by acid pH. So what I'm showing you here is that Paula saw that in MIR1 animals, uh, lysosomes have increased fluorescence, suggesting higher pH and therefore decreased pumping activity of the VATPase. And also these lysosomes are smaller, which is indicative of poor lysosomal function. Moreover, also uh, very strongly supporting the idea of a loss of function, Paula could actually rescue or recover uh, part of the MIR1 defects by promoting assembly of the VATPase complex. So assembly of this complex requires some dedicated chaperones, including BMA21. And when Paula uh, overexpressed BMA21 in MIR1 deficient animals, she could recover the protein aggregation defect and the mitochondrial fragmentation defect. So I think altogether, this tells us that MIR1 is necessary to uh, repress VATPA subunits in muscle, but not to reduce the amount of complex in the cells, rather to ensure that the complex is correctly formed and functions uh, properly in, in the cells. So this is a, a, a bit of a different way of thinking about these repressors. Now, uh, for the sake of time, I won't... You have two yeah. minutes. You have two minutes. Awesome. Thank you. For the sake of time, I won't show you the data, but you can see it in the preprint. We have evidence that this is also conserved in Drosophila. So this could be a conserved uh, micronate, um, uh, conserved MIR1 target that could explain um, this, this very strong conservation of this microRNA. So with that, I know I, I packed quite a bit, but I wanted to give you this context in which we're thinking about microRNAs. And um, I think it has really helped us to further address um, what microRNAs do in, um, in the context of development. I, I hope that I got you thinking about these early and broadly expressed microRNAs and conceptually what does the embryo use these very broadly expressed repressors for? I think this is extremely interesting to discuss, and I hope we get a chance uh, later in the meeting and also uh, at Emilio's poster. Um, but I also wanted to um, highlight how interested we are in these cell type specific microRNAs because we think they can really reveal unique requirements of specialized cells. We think MIR1 has. Uh, in particular, for example, revealed a weak spot in muscle cell biology um, that is unique to muscles. It, it doesn't happen, it, it, it's not required in other cells. And we think these might provide, these repressors might provide entry points to uncover other cell type specific vulnerabilities. But also we're very excited about thinking about how repressors can actually be used to promote function or to improve function, as is the case in this multi-protein uh, complex, the VATPase. So with that, I would like to end by thanking, uh, first and foremost, the people in the lab. I, I hope I mentioned everyone who did the work. Uh, what I showed you was work mostly from Philip, Paula, and Emilio, but these are other students uh, that were in the lab in the past few years and contributed to microRNA projects. We're extremely grateful to IMP and IMBA services over the past years, uh, but also to these community resources without which uh, we really would have a, a much, much harder time getting our job done. 
uh, please visit the posters from Emilio and Alex for non micronate project in the lab. And as Emilio said, um, it's our last few days in Vienna. Next week, we will be in Baltimore. So um, yeah, looking forward to uh, becoming part of the, the East Coast Forum community as well and, and keeping in touch with, with everyone here as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Louisa. That was fabulous. Tons of questions coming in into the Q&A. So uh, we have three minutes, so I'll start. So this is related to also one of the questions that's in the Q&A. So for the cell-specific um, uh, microRNAs, does that cell specificity actually maintain throughout development or does the pattern actually change? So for most of them, so first of all, let me start by saying that I showed larval pictures because it's easier to recognize cells. Most of these start during embryogenesis as soon as cells are uh, born and, and, and specified. And then what we see with these transcriptional reporters is that GFP is sustained. Uh, so I cannot really tell uh, the dynamics of decay of these microRNAs. Some of them are still functional in uh, later in life, like near one, for example. Um, but others may not be. Whether the whether additional um, sites of cells of expression uh, appear, that is that we have not really seen. Okay. Um, so a question from Michael Shapira: um, In your uh, microRNA abundance heat map, where do you find intestinal specific microRNAs? Are there any? And are they expressed at higher levels in other tissue specific microRNAs? Uh, yes, there are a number of uh, intestine-specific microRNAs. I can't remember now all of them. Um, in embryos, they are they might be a bit more abundant, but they're in the mid-range. I can't remember now later in larvae when the intestine really takes up uh, yeah a lot more space uh, whether this is um, whether these become more abundant. But I'm happy to yeah look at this data together or or send yeah more details. But there are many intestinal specific microRNAs. Yeah. Um, okay, so a question which I think is from Martha Soto um, is conserved role in muscles due to metabolic needs of the muscle. Um, if not, why is this microRNA essentially conserved across species? Yeah, this is a very good question. Could be metabolism. That's a, a very good point. And we do know that, uh, for example, mTOR signaling is uh, um, also affected in these animals. What I uh, tend to think, though, is that it's a structural constraint. Uh, muscle cells have a highly structured cytoplasm. You know, uh, most of the cytoplasm is dedicated to the contractile machinery. Uh, as far as we've been reading, that leaves, and also the, the, the ER is highly specialized. The, it becomes a sarcoplasmic reticulum for calcium storage. And so it looks like there might be limited capacity for um, ER associated uh, translation and complex assembly. And this is something that I'm super interested in and, and I hope we can pursue in the future because I, to me that this is now my, yeah, my favorite hypothesis, but let's see. Um, so there's a ton of questions. Unfortunately, this is gonna be the last one. Um, so from Julie Erringer, is there any evidence that other complexes are regulated in a similar way that, uh, as Miran does? Yeah, so um, we, we haven't seen this in um, in worms. We haven't looked at so specifically. There, uh, there are a couple of reports looking more broadly uh, bioinformatically that suggest this might be the case. But of course, uh, with micronase, uh, this this really needs validation. Too many false positives and too yeah, too mm -hmm. much noise. So, but it would be super interesting to to look further. So unfortunately, we have to move on. So there's a ton of questions, Louisa, that you can keep answering in the Q&A. And we also encourage people to stay on at the very end of the 15 minutes. Um, OK, Barbara. Yeah, we'll move on to the second speaker of the opening session, and that is uh, Odette Richavi. And he will in be introduced by a former graduate student uh, in his lab, and that's Itamar Lev. And I hand over to you now. Itamar? Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce Oded Rishavi, my PhD mentor. Oded uh, did his PhD in Joel Klug's lab in Tel Aviv University, studying the transfer of protein and RNA molecules between immune cells. He then moved to Columbia University to the lab of Oliver Roberts, where he showed for the first time that heritable small RNAs mediate the uh, transgenerational responses to the environment. And then in 2012, he started his own lab in Tel Aviv University, and this is actually when we met. Um, in his lab, Odette studies an immense diversity of topics, ranging from piecing together ancient scrolls, using toxoplasma to deliver drugs to the brain, 
starting decision making in worms, and of course the mechanisms that restrict or modulate the inheritance of small RNAs in memory. Oded uh, won many prestigious awards, Kadar Family and Blavatnik, and including the recent prestigious Schmidt Polymath Award. Um, I'm very proud of Oded. I was able to see his vision of the lab coming into life. Um, I think he's a very original scientist and a very supportive mentor. I learned many things from Oded, including how to design elegant experiments, how to focus on what's really important in science, and the really great importance of creativity. Um, and to finish up, I'll just tell a short story for the people following Odette tweets. That one time, Odette and I were just coming out of our favorite coffee shop in the university and saw two soldiers running across us. And then Odette said, oh, this moment could have been a perfect gift for a tweet. <laughs> and I'm still curious what would be the title of, of that tweet, but I will never know. And with this, I will give the stage to Odette to tell you a, new, a very new story that I know he's very excited to share with you, and I'm also very curious to hear. So can you see my screen? Yeah, great. So first, th thanks a lot, uh, Piali and Barbara, uh, for inviting me and uh, Anitama for the for the introduction. Very kind introduction. I mean, I'm honored and embarrassed, and I'm very excited. I don't think I ever participated in a Zoom meeting with more than a thousand people, and um, and this is really amazing. And I'm especially excited because. In the spirit of uh, the warm meeting, I decided to talk about completely unpublished uh, work that I never even spoke about before. This is totally new for me. This is a, a field we never worked on before, never published on before. Uh, and this is extremely excited to do it in the in the biggest stage for us, the, the warm community. So really, thanks a lot. Now, over the since I did my I started my postdoc with Oliver Hobart, I've been studying. Uh, memory. I, I moved to work on C. elegans because I was interested in memory and I was studying transgenerational memory, which is uh, the parental responses that continue to affect the progeny for a very long time, weeks or months even. And, um, and, and as you know, this is uh, mediated by small RNAs in the interaction with the chromatin and so on. While the worms have a very long memory when it comes to these transgenerational responses, surprisingly within the same generation, the memories that worms keep are typically very short. They last just a few hours, and we know this for, for decades. So if you teach the worm an association, for example, that an attractive odor is no longer, shouldn't be attractive because it is paired with starvation or something bad, then the worm uh, will remember it for two or three hours max. And there are a few notable and very, very interesting uh, 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 exceptions for that, but by and large, this is the, this is the rule. Memories are short. We don't know what's the ecological relevance of this, uh, but it's fascinating. And how it is regulated is, is, is the topic of this uh, talk. Now, normally when we think about um, forgetting or loss of memory, we think of it as something bad that we want to avoid. And sometimes it happens in pathology. It can happen due to old age. But of course, forgetting is also adaptive. We don't want to remember everything that, um, that's irrelevant and uh, it's costly energetically probably. And it's also stressful to remember everything. So forgetting has to be regulated and, it, and, and the, the duration of the memory has to evolve. The story starts, it's like a Simpson episode where you always start with something irrelevant and then you move to the real thing. Every Simpson episode starts like that. And the story starts with a, a naive, a very naive I had, a idea that I had more than a decade ago. What I wanted to do is I wanted to teach the worms something uh, and then to freeze them in minus 80, and then to thaw them and see whether the memory stays. And if it would stay, then it could mean that uh, the memory, that keeping the memory doesn't require electrical activity because when you're frozen, there, there isn't any electrical activity. That was the naive idea that I had, and I tried to convince uh, students to do it for, uh, for more than a decade. There, there are technical problems with, this, with testing this. So for once, the, since the memory is short, and uh, until the worms will recuperate from being frozen, they will already forget. And also, you can only efficiently uh, freeze worms when they are um, L1 larvae. And at this point, uh, they don't learn too much. Most of the learning and memory essays are designed for adults. After a long time, I, I thought I finally managed to convince a student to do this. And the student was uh, Dana. Dana Landschaft, and I thought she was working on it, but it turns out she was working on something else and ignored me completely. But it was a good thing because 
that led her to, to a discovery that I would never thought of examining. And what uh, Dana Lenschaff uh, did, and uh, she started these experiments a few years ago with the help of uh, Dror Sagi, who was then a postdoc in the lab. Now he has uh, his uh, own lab in, uh, in Israel. And what Dana wanted to study is uh, if the kinetics of memory is affected by temperature. That was her idea, which is really related to what I wanted to study, but also completely, completely different. And Dana is a very uh, special student. She did it really independently. And all the cred credit for what I'm about to tell you goes to, to her. So Dana, this is uh, your moment. Now, the protocol that Dana did, uh, that ran, this is the basic protocol. She ran a few versions of it. I like it also because it's very low tech and everything that I show you is quite low tech. But uh, what she did is she taught the worms to associate an appetitive odor. She started with butanone, then moved to, moved to other uh, odors, that, uh, to associate this odor with starvation. This is a classic essay for learning and memory and elegance. After you put the worms um, in a tube with, with the odor without food, they learned that, uh, that the odor shouldn't be attractive. And instead of moving towards it in chemotaxis essays, they don't go there. Uh, so if you test immediately after you, you teach them the association, you see that the, the, the memory is there. But if you test a few hours later, it is already gone. So uh, Dana put the worms, um, uh, teach, taught the worm this association like this, and then waited, let the worms wait either in room temperature or on ice to see for how long the memory would stay. That's, that's pretty much it. On ice, the worms are probably uh, at two degrees or something like this, two degrees Celsius approximately. And what she found was very, very surprising. What Dana found was that as long as the worms are on ice, they don't forget. So here you see a chemotaxis essay. Um, these are worms in room temperature. Immediately after they are trained, um, the odor becomes unattractive. But if you uh, come, back to, uh, come back after two hours, then the, the odor is again attractive. They lost the memory. However, if you do the same thing, but the worms are kept on ice, they still, they're, they're not attracted to the odors even uh, two hours later. And it lasts longer than two hours, as I'll show you in a second. It's, it's perhaps easier to look at these uh, things when you, uh, instead of looking at the chemotaxis, I say uh, uh, index, looking at the learning index. Learning index is a measure of uh, memory. Uh, so it's a chemotaxis index of the naive minus the chemotaxis uh, index of the condition. So you see here, immediately after training, the, the learning index is high. The, the worms remember. After two hours, the learning index drops because they forget. But if you keep them on ice, they don't forget. The learning index stay, stays high even two hours later, and even 16 hours later, as you can see here. So this is an eight-fold uh, increase in the, the duration of the memory. You can probably even keep them longer on ice, but at one point they become sick. And then you don't know whether they're not attractive, attracted to the other because uh, they lost the memory or because they are sick. And we don't think that uh, um, during the durations where they are healthy, we don't think that, uh, uh, that uh, the effect is mediated by some inability to smell or some defect in, in sensation because of a few reasons. One of them is the, the, the control group, which is also kept on ice, but wasn't trained to avoid uh, um, butanone, is perfectly okay with butanone after 16 hours on ice or two hours on ice. So it's not, and they, are, they were kept on ice the same way. And also the worms that were trained to avoid butanone or to not like butanone are still attracted to benzaldehyde, which is another odor that is uh, sensed by the AWC neurons, the same neurons that uh, uh, smell uh, butanone. So they probably actually keep the memory as is on ice. We think that what happens here is temporarily that um, that keeping the worms on ice in cold uh, just delays forgetting. It's not that the memory get consolidated, and this is important, because as soon as you remove the worms from the ice, return them to normal temperatures, they start forgetting again. And if you look a few hours later, then the memory is gone. So it's not consolidated, it's just delayed, the, the forgetting is delayed temporarily. Um, interestingly, this works for AWC sensed uh, odors, but not for odors which are sensed by the AWA neurons. These moment memories are not extended on ice. Uh, and it is interesting because it's the first clue that what we're looking here is not just passive 
physical things. It's not just physics. Um, any uh, kin um, reaction is delayed by uh, low temperatures. But here it's not something passive, just passively delaying the, the breakdown of memories, whatever the, the, it is. There's some specificity here pointing to the, suggesting that it's probably a regulated effect. And as I'll show you, that's, that's indeed the case. Okay, what's happening on ice? What's happening when, when you cool the worms that allow them to maintain the memories instead of forgetting them? So there's been fantastic work on cold tolerance done uh, by uh, a number of different groups over the last uh, 15 years or so. And so if you, uh, what they've shown, they, they, they uh, found many of the genes and the uh, tissues that are involved in, in surviving low temperatures. And they've shown that if you just take worms and put them on ice for 48 hours, or pu put them in low temperatures for uh, uh, 48 hours, then they all die. But if before you uh, shock them with the ice, you adapt them to low temperatures, for just a few hours, for a minimum of five hours, if you grow them at 15 degrees Celsius instead of 20, so it's still within the normal range that we grow worms, and then you place them on uh, in the low temperatures, then they won't survive because they switch some, in, some internal state that allows them to deal with the cold. And as I, as I mentioned, some of the pathways that are involved in this have been elucidated. Nicely, this is also plastic. So you can switch cold tolerance on and off. And what they've shown is that if you take worms and you make them cold tolerant by growing them at 15 degrees, and then you bring them back to normal temperature to 20 degrees for two hours, then you make them cold tolerant, cold sensitive again. Now, if you put them at, in two degrees, they will, they will again die. So this, this is something that the worm can switch on and off. It's extremely interesting. And we wanted to see whether uh, cold tolerance is related to the capacity to maintain memories in low temperatures, to the extended the, to memory extension in low temperatures. So what Dana did was before the training, before she paired butanin with uh, starvation, she adapted the worms to 15 degrees overnight. And then, so, so the worms grew in 15 degrees and then she trained them and then she kept them on ice or not. And what she saw is that if the worms were prepared in advance, if they were cold tolerant, then they no longer remember, they no longer extend the memories on ice. Once they switch this internal state that makes them cold tolerant, the capacity to, to delay memories on ice is gone. And just like with the cold tolerance, this is also plastic and you can switch it on and off. If you adapt the worms to 15 degrees, make them cold tolerant, and then bring them back to two degrees to make them cold sensitive again, and then train them, put them on ice, again, the memory would be extended on ice. Okay. This is great and also a good handle to try to understand what's actually happening when the worms are on ice, which genes change that allow them to extend memories. And so we did, we did two ways. First of all, we checked some of the candidate genes, some candidate genes that were associated with cold tolerance in the past and saw whether the mutants can extend memories on ice or not. But we also did it in an unbiased way. We, we uh, divided the worms to, to six groups three different conditions of worms that were made cold tolerant because they were put, grown in 15 degrees, or worms which are cold sensitive uh, because they were grown in normal temperature, or worms that were grown, made cold tolerant and then made cold sensitive again by switching them again to 20 degrees. Two of the groups can maintain memories on ice and one group can't. And then we place the worms on ice, uh, sorry, then we train the worms or not. So we compare naive and conditioned animals in all the three conditions. And then we place them on ice and we sequence from worms that were on ice. I don't think that was uh, done before. We, we sequence uh, old school from, from the entire worm, not single cell or something like this, but that was very good uh, enough for, for getting a good signal and identifying many of the genes that were, identifi that were identified in the past as related to cold tolerance. But we also find some new genes. First, in the genes that were implicated in cold tolerance before, we saw that the entire pathway that leads to diacylglycerol uh, uh, changes. And, we, and this is the GOA1 uh, pathway. And uh, we examined the different mutants and, and we saw that these mutants are defective in their capacity to maintain memories on ice. And uh, the GOA1 pathway eventually controls a DAG, diacylglycerol which is affecting controlling um, synaptic transmission. So that could be uh, the mechanism of forgetting. You control neuronal activity, and then you can, you can make the, warmth, uh, the, the neurons uh, remember longer or shorter. 
But more interestingly, we also found genes that were not associated with cold and that are specifically required for the memory function of the ice, of the low temperatures. And the, the most interesting gene that we found, or the first, the one that we focused on first because it seems the most relevant was TRX1, which is, which is a gene that encodes for thyroidoxin. It's highly conserved uh, gene. And, uh, and this gene was only upregulated in worms that were trained in conditions that allow them to maintain memories on ice. So, so it seems relevant to the, to, to the, to the, mem the, the capacity to, mem to memorize. And moreover, this gene is specifically expressed in the ASJ neurons, which were previously uh, shown to be required for cold tolerance. I forgot to say that cold tolerance is also regulated by the nervous system. So this all pointed to TRX1 as being a very interesting uh, gene to test. So Dana tested the, the mutants and she found amazingly, I think it's amazing, the TRX1 mutants remember longer, even after five hours, they don't forget, and we, we want to test this, uh, whether it lasts even longer, even after five hours, they don't forget, even when the worms never experience the cold temperatures. So these are just normal growth conditions. The mechanism that allows uh, um, the, the temperature to affect memory is still affected in these worms because they show the opposite effect. In low temperatures, they remember less well, which is interesting. We don't know how this is happening. Okay, I'm getting close to, to the end of, of my talk. I will just say that uh, now is the time for, for a little bit of, uh, of uh, luck, the, the, role, the role of luck in science. And we wanted to know whether you can affect this mechanism externally, whether you can control it, not just by switching the temperatures, perhaps by, by dragging the, the worms in some way. And then we went for a lab retreat, retreat. And in the lab retreat that was in the negative two hours from uh, Tel Aviv, it was a good lab retreat. But when, when I came back, I did something that I never do, which is I listened to a podcast. I never listened to podcasts. And in this podcast, it was a podcast about lithium. It was a radio lab uh, podcast, highly recommended. And they discussed lithium. And lithium is a very uh, interesting uh, molecule, it, a, a, an atom, actually. It's the third atom in the periodic table formed already in the Big Bang. And, and you can find it in, uh, in nature, in, uh, in salts, like in Bolivia, there are big fields with the, with the lithium chloride. And it is used, as you all know, as a drug for bipolar disorders for many, many years, although it's not entirely clear why. It's quite amazing. This is the topic of the, of the podcast that, that, that there's a drug which is just, just an atom. This is amazing. Uh, and that's so efficient. And we really don't understand how it works. So the idea that I had, it was totally unrelated to Dana's project, was to test how lithium affect worms. I thought that because they have a, such a simple nervous system, maybe you can study the mechanism of how it works. Then I came back from the drive, I googled it, and I found it. it's not an original idea before at all. It was studied before. Uh, and just a few years ago, this beautiful paper has shown that lithium works specifically by inhibiting a phosphatase, BP, uh, BPNT1, and affects specifically just the ASJ neurons. Not only that, in that paper by uh, Meisel and Kim, they have a, a, a figure that shows that lithium downregulates uh, TRX1, this gene that we found the mutant to remember longer, it, it downregulates the TRX1 expression. So obviously, I, I quickly emailed uh, Dana, go check if lithium affects memory. And what Dana found was that grown, worms that were grown in lithium overnight maintain memories much longer. So even five hours, after five hours, they don't forget. Now she's going to also check longer periods, even 16 hours or so. And we assume that it's related to the other mechanism because this is how we got to lithium. But there are, I mean, but obviously many avenues we can uh, choose and, I, uh, and that we need to study in the future. And I hope this will uh, furnish a lot of work for the lab, for many people in the lab um, in the future. But it all started uh, with, with Dana's work. And really, Dana is the star of this project. He worked a, a long time, very hard on it, together with Dro, who started his own lab. And also with other people in the lab, Sarit, Hila, many undergrads that help her, and technicians. And, uh, and, uh, and, um, but, but the credit goes to Dana, who, who led it from the very start. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, of course, I'd be very, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Odette, for an amazing talk. And actually, I, I want to ask something. Have you combined lithium with low temperature with the ice treatment? 
to see whether no. it sort of enhances each other. No, that, we, we didn't check if it's in, it enhances each other. The, the experiment that Dan is supposed to do next week is to see whether lithium effect worms that were adapted to 15 degrees before, the, the whether when they switch to the condition that doesn't allow them to maintain memories on ice. We want to see whether it will extend memory also then, but, but we don't have this experiment yet. Okay, there actually were a bunch of questions about temperature somewhere like if you uh, keep the worms at higher temperature, does that reduce the length of time that they can maintain the memory? And also, is there sort of a temperature cutoff or is it more a gradual effect? Yeah, we didn't check high temperatures. That's a very good uh, suggestion. Uh, with regard to the low temperatures and the cutoff, we were just following the cold tolerance literature. And they really defined how many hours you need to uh, uh, cool the worms to kill them, how many hours you need to adapt them. We didn't do all the variations possible, but this is something that we can do. Excellent. And um, there was also a question uh, from Jin Han. Does memory save in other neuronal activities? I mean, is this something only specific to this kind of memory or others as well? Uh, uh, we don't know if it stabilizes other forms of memory. Um, uh, the Kim lab has shown that lithium affects ASG functions. So for example, Dower exit, things like that. Uh, but uh, um, perhaps you can think of it as an extension of the Dower period. I don't think so. But, uh, but we didn't check whether it affects, um, st whether it stabilizes other types of memories. And there was another question on chemo attraction and chemo repulsion are both affected by this, this effect on low temperature? We didn't check uh, uh, aversive substances to see whether uh, these type of memories are affected. Megan, this is all things we can do and are very interesting. And let's see, um, is there, this is from Tita Sengupta, is there a synaptic communication between ASJ and AWC in this context? That That's you... an excellent question. They are not connected by synapses. Uh, um, it could be some neuropeptide communication. This is things that we are checking, but we don't know. Excellent. And um, does the antioxidant activity of TIX1 have a role in memory as well? This is from Tana Paris. Yeah, we don't know. Now we're checking redox de uh, uh, dead mutants uh, that were kindly provided to us by Antonio uh, just uh, a few weeks ago. So we'll know whether it's, it's related to that, but we don't know yet. Excellent. And there are more questions coming. Johannes Luc uh, Assis is asking, does ice result in any morphological changes in this synapses that extends retention of the memory? Anything visible? Yeah, we, so we didn't do EM or anything like this to, to, to say this, but I think that this is a, um, since the, the memory is not consolidated, it's temporary, two hours later it is gone. We don't think that ne necessarily it necessitates any structural changes. It's probably short-term memory. And um, Mark Pilon is asking, can you speculate on the molecular mechanism by which memory is stabilized in TIX1 mutants or by cold? Yeah, so it could, it could be just uh, um, affecting the diacetyl uh, literal uh, pathway, which affects synaptic transmission. Then when a, a neuron a is active or inactive because of the modulation of the system, this leads to forgetting. So once it is reactivated again, then the worms forget, but that's a very simplistic view of things. That's the, 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 the pathway, pathway that we identified as responsible. And I'm just going through more question here. Dominic Clauser is asking great or saying great story. Could your behavioral data be explained by a shift in AWC on response threshold adaptation. Keeping in mind that AWC is a cold sensor while AWA is not. Yeah, I thought that the AWC is a, is a, a high temperature sensor, but I could be wrong. Uh, um, not that it's a cold uh, temperature sensor, um, but it could be related to, to the fact that it is affected by, that the neuron itself is affected by temperature. But from what I know, it is affected by high, it, it is a sensor for high temperature. And Brandon Carpenter is asking, do you think small RNAs and our chromatin modifiers are participating in this? 
in this memory. Um, right. Of course, I'll be interested in such a scenario since we study small RNAs and chromatin. We don't have a, a, um, an a priori reason to suspect that this would be the case, but it's, it's something that we'll definitely be checking nevertheless, just because this is what we do. Uh, and of course, if, if there is any uh, a relation to, um, to any epigenetic mechanism, this would be uh, amazing. Excellent, thanks so much. And Piali, we can move to the next speaker. Okay, thanks, Oded. Um, so our final speaker of the session is the fabulous Emily Tramel from UCSD. Um, and uh, before I introduce the introducer, uh, let me just say some of you are raising hands. We actually can't see those um, hands. So if you have questions, please do put them in the Q&A box. Um, okay, so to introduce Emily um, is uh, uh, Elan Tekle, who is a project scientist in her lab. Hi everyone, um, it's my pleasure to do introduce Emily Trimmel. Um, Emily received her BS from the University of Wisconsin-Madison where she began working with C. elegans in the lab of Judith Kimmel. She con continued as a PhD student with Corey Bardman at UCSF and as a postdoctoral researcher with Fred Ostebel at MGH. Emily's curiosity and drive to ask unique novel big picture questions led her to discovering the first natural pathogen of C. elegans. Since establishing her lab at UCSC, Emily has won too many awards for me to list in this short introduction. As a mentor, Emily has created a supportive, creative, and rigorous scientific environment in which scientists at all levels thrive, and for which I and her other trainees are eternally grateful for. So I'll turn it over to Emily, who will be telling us about C. elegans response to natural intracellular pathogens. Great, thank you so much, Elin, for that introduction. Um, and thanks to Piali and Barbara for the invitation to speak. The worm meeting, it's sort of like a family reunion for me, and it's really wonderful to be a part of it. Um, I uh, would say that, you know, Barbara and Piali are super impressive in their resilience and adaptability to being on Zoom and it's not perfect, but I realize it allows me to show off my worm earrings that I uh, learned about from Anna Scope <laughs> on her Facebook page. So, so there are some benefits to Zoom, but uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing everybody in person for the next, the next meeting. So the title of my talk is Worm Health Organization, Understanding Pandemics Facing C. elegans. And this image is a worm with the intestinal cells labeled here with GFP. So give me and a second, Emily. Um, Jason, where I am actually not seeing the slide. I don't know if it's just me. It's just, it's showing up as white. It's showing up off screen. I'm seeing the same thing. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Let's so see. Actually, I do believe I have a backup for you, Emily. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I was having some last minute laptop challenges. So maybe that was what was responsible for. Actually, let me let me quickly try one thing um, to see if that works. All right. I can have it up in about five, 15 seconds. If... Okay. Well, let me try okay. this. So All I've right. stopped mirroring. All right. Is this working? Um, are you sharing? I uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Let me try that again. Okay, can you ah, see? Much better. Okay, can you see these? Yeah, uh, go to screen uh, presentation. Let's see. Okay, I'm presenting now. It's still blank. It's still blank. All right, well, let's do the backup slides. Me, so, if you'd like me to, oh. oh, so this shows up, but as soon as you go to presentation or uh, the slide mode, it seems try it again. Move forward. Nope, it's all blank, white blank for me. Okay, all right. all right. I'll go ahead and share and just let me know when you want me to advance to the slide. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry for that. No problem. Maybe you could just wave your hand when you want Jason to move your slide. Okay. Okay, all right, so yeah, so let's uh, start again. So the Title of the talk is Worm Health Organization Understanding Pandemics Facing C. elegans. And so the image here is a worm with the intestinal cells labeled with GFP and a pathogen that's causing a pandemic for C. elegans that's labeled in red. So if you go to the next slide, 
Um, I just wanted to start by kind of reflecting on some of the lessons I think we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. So next is the power of scientific community. I think it's really amazing how the community mobilized to respond to this crisis and provide safe and effective vaccines. And a related lesson is the power of immunity that um, you know, these vaccines tap into our body's own adaptive immune system, which is a learned response to provide protection against future infections. And the adaptive immune system, it relies on these specialized immune cells called T cells and B cells. And these get a lot of the attention um, when it comes to immunity. But what's I think less well understood is that the adaptive immune system relies on the innate immune system. So that's required to trigger adaptive immune responses. And innate immunity includes in humans, both professional and non-professional immune cells. So professional immune cells include cells like macrophages, um, and when it comes to non-professional immune cells, almost any cell can be that, including epithelial cells. So, um, and it's in, in the case of humans, you know, a lot less studied the role of the non-professional immune cells. And as far as we know, C. elegans is relying entirely on non-professional immune cells for its responses. So these include cells, if you go to the next um, bullet point, cells like epithelial cells of the intestine. And these cells are actually the ones that are the first to be infected by pathogens. So if you keep advancing forward, yep. And when these cells get infected, it's worked from a number of different labs that indicate they sense the perturbations and damage that um, are caused by pathogens. So the next, yeah, go to the next bullet point. And when these pathogens are sensed, it leads to um, defense responses, including secretion of antimicrobial compounds and upregulation of detoxifying enzymes. So this slide shows you that there are two general types of microbial pathogens. So those that are extracellular replicating outside of cells, and then those that can invade and replicate inside of the cells, the intracellular pathogens. And it's, um, become apparent through studying C. elegans in the wild that they're infected by both of these types of microbial pathogens. So if you advance to the next point, um, so there's both bacterial as well as fungal extracellular pathogens. Um, and if you go to the next point, yep, <laughs> this is where all my extra animation is <laughs> causing delays. Um, so when it comes to intracellular pathogens, if you go to the next, um, Word. Yeah, the, we know of um, no bacteria that are natural intracellular pathogens of C. elegans in the wild. We know of one virus, which is the Orsay virus, and we know of a number of species in the Microsporidia phylum, which are fungal related pathogens. So the question that I'm going to describe to you or our work um, addressing is how C. elegans responds to these natural intracellular pathogens. And I'm first going to describe to you work on Microsporidia. So on the next slide, um, I'll describe to you how microsporidia are um, a, a whole phylum of obligate intracellular pathogens, and it includes over 1,400 species, and they can affect a really wide range of hosts from humans all the way down to single-celled protists. And so work on microsporidia infections in C. elegans began when Antoine Barriard and Marion Felix's lab was sampling compost pits near Paris and found a strain of worms that had intracellular microbes in the intestinal cells. And they very generously shared the strain with me to determine what the identity of the pathogen was. And if you go to the next little arrow that points to one of these intracellular microbes, you can see it kind of looks like a rod shaped bacterium, but we found through sequencial analysis, it's not bacteria. It actually belongs to this microsporidia phylum, which are eukaryotes. And because it um, had sequence that was distinct enough, we gave it a new genus and species name that we named Nematoceta parisii or nematode killer from Paris. Um, and Marianne was also sampling um, other parts of the world, including Kerala, India, where she found a strain of wild-caught C. briggsi that was infected with a pathogen that was morphologically quite similar, um, but different enough in sequence that we gave it a new species name and called it Nematocita ossibelli for Fred Ossibel, who is a pioneer in the world of post-pathogen interactions. So these two species are just um, now among 20 species that have been isolated, 20 species of microsporidia infecting wild caught C. elegans and other nematodes around the world. Um, and then in the next little um, table that's showing here, you can see now there's 14 in the nematocita gen genus, and there's three other genera as well. And then in the next slide, yeah, you can see basically um, the lion's share of this work actually has been done by Marianne Felix in her lab and some really nice work um, by Gao Tianzang um, in his thesis work describing 47 strains. 
Um, and I also want to highlight Robert Llewellyn and Aaron Ranke who have both isolated um, new strains and species, some of which are published and others that are unpublished. And just um, of note, the summary I'm showing is from Aaron Ranke and his lab is doing some really important work cataloging and creating a database of microsporidae that infect not only nematodes, but also all organisms. So from these sampling studies, it appears that NPCI is the most common cause of infection for C. elegans in the wild. And that's the one we've characterized in greatest detail in the lab. So on the next slide, um, I'll describe to you sort of the life cycle that begins when C. elegans eats an infectious spore. And when that's in the lumen of the intestine, it can fire a tube that's an infection apparatus that's used to directly deliver a parasite cell into host intestinal cells. That then will replicate as a multinucleate structure called a murant, um, which is in the next little tab here, and then go forward a couple more. And then when it differentiates back into spores, those will basically fill up the entire intestine. And then the worms will die prematurely of this infection, um, hence the word nematocida or nematode killer. So if you go forward a couple um, tabs, you can see that while the pathogen is developing inside of intestinal cells, it's also restructuring host tissue as it goes. So this was work from Kirbala and Robert Llewellyn when they were grad students in the lab. This is this image I showed at the beginning, that sort of red pathogen that's um, actually moving from cell to cell, fusing host cells together, intestinal cells in this case, we think to facilitate its spread throughout the host organs. And then in the next picture, you'll be able to see what happens later in the life cycle when the pathogen hijacks host exocytosis so it can non-lytically exit into the lumen of the intestine. And then it can be defecated out into, um, onto the plate and if, if we're growing worms on a plate, and then that can infect another host. So it's part of a fecal oral life cycle of infection. And then on the next slide, you can see that um, we think that nematocida, even though it has a really compact genome, smaller than lots of bacterial genomes, a large fraction of its genes encode proteins that are host exposed. And this was defined by Aaron Ranke when he was a postdoc in the lab. So he used localized proteomics to identify proteins that interface the cytoplasm um, directly, either because they're attached to the membrane outside of the murant or secreted into the cytoplasm or some that actually seem to make it into the nucleus as well. So with these hundreds of proteins interacting with host tissue, it's a little surprising that the C. elegans transcriptional response to this fungal pathogen is similar to the response to a much simpler pathogen. So this is work from Melina Mikowski when she was a postdoc in the lab using RNA-seq to define the genes induced by n pericii um, upregulated at these different time points after infection. So if you go forward a couple, um, you can see how she used GC analysis to compare this response to the response to other pathogens, including bacterial pathogens like Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staphylococcus aureus. So those are the next couple little tabs forward. So the black here indicates there's no similarity between the genes induced by bacterial pathogens shown here and n -pericii. There was a little bit more similarity with genes induced by an extracellular fungal pathogen, Dreschmeria. Um, and uh, where there was by far the most striking similarity was the genes induced by the Orsay virus. So Orsay virus, as I mentioned, is another natural intracellular pathogen. It was isolated by Marianne Felix and characterized by Dave Wang. Um, on the next slide um, shows you sort of the cartoon of the um, Orsay virus, which like the coronavirus is a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus, but simpler than the coronavirus only has three genes. Um, and yet it's turning on a nearly identical transcriptional response as this 2600 gene um, fungal pathogen, which actually like viruses are obligate intracellular pathogens. They only can replicate inside of host tissue. So they have a similar sort of lifestyle. So this common set of genes um, induced, we call the intracellular pathogen response or IPR genes. And they include about 80 different genes, um, uh, including uh, ubiquitin ligase components. You can go forward a couple tabs. Um, and uh, so these are enzymes that uh, can tag proteins to alter their fate. The IPR genes also include PALS genes, which have unknown biochemical function, um, but they're distantly related to FBOX genes that are uh, encode adapters for ubiquitin ligase complexes. And a lot of nice work was done characterizing the PALS genes by Eduardo Leva Diaz and, and Oliver Hovitz lab. So on the next slide, you can see um, one of these PALS genes that's highly induced by infection. Um, the promoter, when you fuse it to GFP, put it in worms, you don't see much infection expression in the absence of infection. 
But if you look at worms either infected with N. Precii or virus in the next tab, you'll see expression of GFP throughout the intestine of these animals. In the next um, cartoon, you'll see we've used um, a number of genetic screens, including just a simple F2 screen for constitutive expression in the absence of infection, and have found negative regulators of this response. So those include um, PALS22, which is a PALS gene that's not induced by infection, but is um, repressing expression of PALS genes that are and other IPR genes. Um, and then another negative regulator is PMP1, which is a purine enzyme. So this is work done by Kirthi Reddy, uh, when she was in the lab and by Elin Techley, my introducer. So on the next slide, um, I wanna just kind of describe to you how we were able to use these negative regulators as um, tools to understand what are the phenotypes associated with activating this IPR program. So in PALS22 and PMP1 mutants, IPR genes are constitutively expressed. And what we find is they have um, increased resistance to infection, including viral infection. You can see viral load is lower in the PNP1 mutants and PALS22 mutants, um, and also in and preci infection on this next graph, you can see there's lower levels in PNP1 mutants and PALS22 mutants. So um, to learn more about these negative regulators, I encourage you to um, please see Elin's talk and then also posters by Crystal and Spencer, which will be up in the next tab. Um, yeah, thanks Jason for doing all of this. Um, and I also do want to highlight a poster from Aaron Ranke's lab, by, or uh, sorry, a talk from Aaron Ranke's lab, which is in the next tab um, from Alex Willis. Oh, oh, no, sorry, that was in my updated slides. All right, <laughs> this old version. Okay, a couple of things are missing, but it's all good. All right, so the next slide, um, this is, yeah, basically just kind of summarizing to you, if you go to the next tab, that the upregulation of IPR genes is associated with resistance to intracellular pathogens. Um, but also with another phenotype, which is resistance to heat shock. And this is shown in the graph here where PALS22 mutants have increased survival after heat shock compared to wild type animals. And it's restored back to wild type levels if you've lost a core, compo core component um, of a SCF ubiquitin ligase called COL6. So if you tab forward the SCF ubiquitin ligase here, we've now used genetics and biochemistry to define um, the components of this multi subunit ligase that promotes resistance to heat shock. And um, for more information um, and sort of unpublished data, please see Mario's poster on this topic. So for the rest of my talk, I wanna to describe to you how the IPR is induced by infection. Um, and this is something that, again, you know, referring back to this observation that this three gene RNA virus molecularly so different from this 2600 gene fungal pathogen is inducing a similar set of genes. We thought, well, maybe they're causing a kind of common physiological impact on the host. And that's then leading to expression of this common gene set. And the physiological impact we um, analyzed was proteotoxic stress because we knew um, from work that Melina Bukowski had done that um, both virus and N. parisii will cause hallmarks of proteotoxic stress in the animal, the ubiquitin and aggregates. Um, and she also had found that proteotoxic stress will induce IPR gene expression. But the timing wasn't quite right, so it takes a little while for the proteotoxic stress to happen. And we saw a quicker induction with both virus and N. parisii. And while we don't know yet how N. parisii is being sensed, I'll tell you briefly about how or say virus can be sensed to turn on this response. And it's um, something to note that C. elegans, although there are similar signaling pathways in some cases, for the most part, I would say C. elegans seems to lack the canonical immune receptors that are described in mammals. But one exception is um, receptors in the rig eye like receptor family. So this is really important in mammals for sensing viruses like the coronavirus to turn on an antiviral um, interferon response. And C. elegans has, um, three rig eye like receptors, including DRH1, and work from a number of labs have shown that this appears to be rewired in terms of what it induces for a response. So it turns on an antiviral RNA interference response instead of an interferon response. And the next um, tab forward, you can see um, just again, this signaling pathway in mammals that has rig eye, but C. like C. elegans does, but C. elegans lacks MAVs and ERF3 and interferon. So instead of this transcriptional response, um, uh, in C. elegans, it's been described to have this RNA interference response. But we were wondering if there is also a transcriptional response as well. And this is work from Jessica Soho when she was a postdoc in the lab together with Hong Bing Jang when he was in Dave Wang's 
labs at, at WashU. So they looked at this PALS5 GFP IPR reporter that expresses GFP in the intestine upon viral infection in wild type animals and found that in DRH1 mutants in the next image that there was an induction of this response. And it's quantified in the next graph um, with each dot being an individual worm analyzed by the worm sorter and having um, increased GFP expression on the Y axis in wild type animals upon viral infection, but not in DRH1 mutants. And in the next graph, you'll see that it's not because these DRH1 mutants are um, not getting affected. They actually have high reviral load compared to wild type animals. They're, not just, they're just not turning on a transcriptional response. So Jessica looked on the next slide at how um, DRH1 might play a role in response to other triggers of the IPR and found that it's not required for response to microsporidia infection. You can see here it's um, GFP expression is induced in wild type animals with NPCI as well as in DRH1 mutants. And then in the next graph, you can see that um, if you block the proteasome with bortezomib to cause proteotoxic stress, it induces GFP reporter expression in wild type animals and also in DRH1 mutants. So on the next slide, you can see then um, this sort of cartoon of how uh, DRH1 is used for triggering the IPR upon virus, but not upon um, these other triggers of the IPR. And Jessica um, did analysis also of these various components that work with DRH1 in uh, antiviral RNA interference and found that they're not required for this um, transcriptional response. So Jessica also did RNA-seq um, to learn about what aspect of the Orsay virus is being sensed. And it turns out you can just express one viral RNA segment that encodes, as far as we know, just one gene that's a polymerase that will allow replication of viral RNA um, uh, and sort of an amplification process. And just that alone is sufficient to turn on the IPR. And so we um, have the model and also based on similarity to, to human studies that it's double-stranded RNA or some viral replication pr um, product that's sufficient to trigger this response. Emily, you've got two. Okay, thanks, good. Um, so if you go to the next um, model, again, because this sort of signaling pathway in mammals has components that are lacking in the C. elegans genome, we are interested in what DRH1 is using to signal. And in the next slide, I'll tell you about one factor we found that came through testing um, predicted transcription factors with RNAi. And the next image, you can see how if you knock down this one factor ZIP1 with RNAi, it will block the induction of PALS5 GFP that we see constitutively on a PALS22 mutants. So Vladimir Milazatish, who is a postdoc in the lab, has done a lot of nice work to show that all of these triggers require ZIP1 for activating the IPR. And what's shown here um, on the left is and pre-CI inducing PALS5 GFP in wild type animals, but not ZIP1. And in the next slide, you can see how Vladimir analyzed um, ZIP1 expression by fusing endogenously tagging with GFP, express, C expression in the intestinal nuclei. And he also showed that um, ZIP1 is important for promoting um, resistance because the mutants have higher viral load. And they also have higher microsporidial load, which can be observed um, in the next graph if you look in a PNP1 mutant background where the IPR genes are already activated. So on the next slide then, this um, shows you that ZIP1 is a transcription factor that seems to be a common hub for the intracellular pathogen response, um, but it's not acting alone. Um, so Vladimir did RNA-seq to show that we now can divide the IPR genes into two different groups. So on the next slide, you can see that ZIP1, it's required for um, about a third of the IPR genes to be activated, but there's a remaining class, class B, that are induced um, in the absence of ZIP1. So we're still looking for that other transcription factor. And to learn more, please see Vladimir's poster. Um, he also has a um, paper uploaded to BioArchive. So to sum up, um, yeah, on the next slide, thanks. Um, what I told you about is this pandemic facing C. elegans in the wild, microsporidia infecting all around the globe. And through looking at the common response to MPCI and this uh, very molecularly distinct pathogen, the Orsay virus, we've learned about this previously undescribed innate immune response that's promoting resistance to these pathogens. And through um, further analysis, we were, were um, excited to learn more about this innate immune system in C. elegans and to compare that with how it's been rewired in mammals. So that's the last part on this slide. If you can go forward, Jason. Yeah, in terms of how it's been rewired and what are the similarities and differences in these, these less well understood non-professional immune cells. 
So with the last slide, which is the acknowledgements, I think I hopefully mentioned everybody as I went along, but of course, thanks to Vladimir and Elin and Jessica, and, and please see um, posters. And I um, also wanted to highlight that Elin's gonna be an assistant professor starting this um, August at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills. And wanna highlight also former members with their own labs and collaborators and funding and Wormbase and CGC, you guys are great too. And yeah, thanks everybody for your attention. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Thanks so much, Emily. That was awesome. Um, there are several questions in the chat, so I'm just going to try and go through them a little bit quickly. Um, so let me start out with a question from Bikash. Um, he wants to know um, how are the intestinal epithelial cells, what makes them specific for the infection as opposed to other epithelial cells? Oh, yeah, that's an excellent question. And I didn't really talk about that in my um, talk in the sense that you know, there's some pathogens that affect the intestine and then there's other like Dreshmeria studied by Eubank and Pujol and other labs that infect the epidermis. And that's something that we're I think, still trying to understand how you get the specificity for that. One thing I will comment is that Robert Llewellyn, when he was a postdoc in the lab, identified a new nematocetus species called nematocetus displodere that unlike Parisii and other nematocetus species that can actually infect um, the epidermis. So it gets into the lumen of the intestine. Um, but it's able to infect more distal tissues like the epidermis and the muscle. And he found that it has a longer tube, that infection apparatus. So we think in that case is that it's able to shoot all the way through the intestine and get into those more distal tissues. But that tish question of tissue tropism is a really important and interesting one. That a lot going to be a lot of different answers, I think. Right. So a question from Theodora Tolkien. Um, so um, she wants to know if the, the nematocyta merant actively fuses the host cells or is the cell fusion uh, sort of an effect of the mechanism that kicks in after the breaks down between the two cells? Yeah, such a good question. Yeah. So Kirbala did that work when he was in the lab. He was really trying to understand that. He's got some beautiful videos. I didn't have a time to show that yeah, we don't, the short answer is we don't know. Um, the longer answer is the videos almost make it look like the neurons like pushing through from one cell to the other. And Kier actually did a whole, I don't know, 100,000 haploid genome screen to try to find host factors that are required for that fusion. Didn't find anything, of course, evidence of absence isn't absent. <laughs> evidence of absence isn't absence. Absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's some viruses that, you know, essentially, are able to fuse similarly to that. So yeah, definitely be interesting work for the future. Question for Martha, which sort of relates to this. Do you know if um, uh, warm fusogens are involved at all or there's some other pathway? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so Kier did test F1 and F2 um, and I don't remember if you test the double mutant and I think, yeah, we were going to test some others, but yeah, there's other warm fusogens that could be tested, but the, he tested the likely suspects and didn't see any effect in that background. Question from um, Aaron Osborne Nishimura. So is there, is there a specific developmental stage? Are worms more competent to uh, mount an immune response at a specific developmental stage? Oh, I love these questions because <laughs> I have some answers. Um, so this again was worked by Kirbalo and he was a grad student in the lab. And he did some really nice work to show natural variation and resistance. So CB4856 worms from Hawaii have increased resistance. They can actually clear the infection, but they can only do it as L1s. So they can't clear once they get older. And he also he did a lot of really nice work to show that this is um, exactly the stage at which infection will, so infection at any stage will shorten lifespan, but it's only infection at the L1 that reduces the number of progeny. So it kind of makes, you know, it's teleological explanation, but it kind of makes sense that that's the phase evolutionarily where you would really care about resistance, that L1 stage. Uh, last question, unfortunately, for now. Um, so it, uh, it's from Alejandro Vasquez. Is uh, mechanisms like autophagy um, upregulated by these pathogens? Yeah, the, uh, excellent question as well. Yeah, so we don't see any transcriptional upregulation of autophagy, um, but we do find varying roles in some emerging story work from Kier and Vladimir Lazatish in the, well, in the lab and Crystal Chan and others. Um, we do have evidence it's promoting um, resistance, but it's complicated. It's, and autophagy is so many different things now. There's canonical and non-canonical and all sorts of different, different versions of it. So yeah, uh, but uh, please, yeah, stay tuned on that. We're, we're working on it. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. I think we're gonna, oh, Barbara, you wanna take over? Yeah, we, we have a few more minutes, we think. Uh, we don't well, we know actually, if we're gonna- No, we have till 11.45. So at 11.45, okay. Zoom will automatically shut off. So we have to 11.45 okay. to address questions. Okay. 
That's great. And I've just seen that Louisa has answered a lot of questions already, but there's one for Louisa for, from uh, Anyuta Das. Dr. Louisa, MIR1 null worm showed fragmented mitochondria. I'm curious, does MIR1 has a role in mitochondrial quality control or known to be negatively regulated? regulating mitochondrial fusion. Luisa, can you answer this? Yes, thanks for the question. So what we observe is indeed that there's fragmented mitochondria. These uh, can be caused by two different, uh, in, in two different ways. One is we know that just deregulating the VATPase causes these. And in fact, Gary Rapkin has a paper where he saw the same thing that uh, loss of lysosomal function because of reduced VATPase activity results indirectly in mitochondrial fragmentation. So this is very likely due to defects in mitophagy, we think. But there's this other target uh, of MIR1 that is DCT1 and that is directly involved in mitophagy. And so I didn't have time to talk about this, but deregulating DCT1 alone by mutating the uh, MIR1 binding sites also causes this mitochondrial fragmentation. So we think there's two ways in which MIR1 is ensuring that mitochondria homeostasis is maintained. Excellent, great. Um, uh, okay, um, Oded, next for you. Um, so uh, this summarizes a bunch of questions in the Q&A. Um, so what makes this memory um, specific for AWC, the cold temperature memory? And is the TRX1 phenotype also specific for AWC? Um, um, good question. Uh, we don't know. I mean, the cold, the cold, uh, uh, the extension of memory on ice is AWC specific, at least for the, when it comes to diacetyl, the memory of diacetyl in AWC sense, no one is not extended. But Dana is uh, texting me as we speak that in the TRX1 mutant, she did see some extension also of memory of diacetyl. So, uh, so, we, so I don't know. I mean, of course, there's literature about the differences between the two neurons, and this is something we'll have to elucidate further. So, there might be different mechanisms potentially for different pathways. Yeah, could be. Actually, there, there was another question in the in the Q and A. Maybe you answered it already, but a question about whether overexpression of TRX one can be beneficial. Uh, yeah, perhaps it can in, in um, promote forgetting. Perhaps it works in the other way. Right, right uh, forgetting. We, right. So let's yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it could be. We need to test this. We didn't do it yet, but it is interesting. Emily, um, so for you, um, so what, uh, so the question from Alejandro Zarati, um, so can you say a little bit more about what kind of prote proteotoxic stress activates IPR response and is it also uh, activated by other types of stresses? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, so we know that if you block the proteasomes, we've done RNA-seq, that you get um, essentially the entire IPR activated, uh, minus a handful of genes. Um, and for those of you who are sort of aficionados of proteotoxic stress, you can also um, induce a number of those genes. There's a, a subset of genes that are induced through skin one, and that's entirely separate from the genes we're seeing through um, IPR. So you, heat shock, uh, you know, we basically can't get the IPR to turn on before worms will die, but chronic heat stress, so like 30 degrees for about 18 to 20 hours will turn on a subset. We haven't done RNA-seq, so we don't know the full extent. Um, Spencer Gang in the lab recently, um, something we've been meaning to do for a long time, tested oxidative stress doesn't turn on this response. So, um, and I've been meaning uh, also to look at, so we've done a number of work sort of the outputs of the IPR in terms of misfolded proteins, but, um, uh, I believe there's also data showing that like misfolded proteins will turn it on. But again, we need, we need to do a little bit more, more work to precisely define that. And there was one more interesting question for Odette also. Did you see a difference between males and hermaphrodites? We, we didn't check this. We didn't test this yet. Um, coming back to you, Emily, um, a couple of questions about the BZIP transcription factors. So is this ZIP1 specific or is it other BZIPs um, also involved? And is there any change in ZIP1 localization activity in DRH1 mutants with or without infection? Yeah, so from the screen that was like 380 predicted transcription factors, there's quite a few BZIPs in there. Um, and ZIP1 was the only one that came out. And we actually did the screen a couple different ways, both in a PALS22 mutant, and then also with this chronic heat stress. Um, in terms of trying to remember exactly how many we specifically have tested, but it's possible there are others that are involved. I know 
quite a large number of them we have tested and aren't involved, but there may be there may be more. And this is where we have a reporter for that ZIP1 independent response. And so we started yeah, the process that we're going to be screening that to try to find another um, factor. And, and then I guess also the question of whether, I think that was from Jonathan, of whether right. changes localization. Um, so we basically, so Vladimir really can't see any expression unless he treats with bortezomib. And then he can start to see it in the um, intestinal nuclei. And preliminarily is also seeing it with be induced with NPCI and um, uh, viral infection. I don't think he's done anything yet with um, DRH1 mutants, but we should. Yeah. You are all answering too fast here. Um, let's see. Yeah, maybe one more for Odette. Someone asked um, Nasima whether you whether this could um, did you take into account the slowing down of aging by low temperature that this sort of had an effect on memory? Yeah, I just finished typing the answer. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I, I hope I did the right, but it was while listening, so maybe it's um, it's better to to talk about. It. I think that uh, probably the the we start with young adults. And if the and and the worms that are growing for five hours even in fifteen, switch to the cold tolerant state and they learn less well on ice. So if anything, it shouldn't. It's the opposite effect of then forgetting because of aging. And and in any case, the entire essay is just a couple of hours. So I doubt that uh, this is because of differences in the aging of the worms. Okay. Thank you. So I'll uh, also ask you a question, Odette. That uh, uh, so. You talk, so it's two hours, um, so transcription could be involved, but obviously non-transcriptional mechanisms can also be involved. Do you know if there's any changes in any kind of localization of synaptic proteins, anything else? No, no, this is something that we need to do systematically. It's not so easy even to think about how to do this. Um, I'm getting emails as we speak with suggestions, mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's less <laughs> trivial than just sequencing mRNAs and following the, the obvious hints that, that come out. Yeah, so there is a nice work from uh, uh, Uichi Ino's lab about the altered localization of the DAF2 isoform, right? Um, and so that's something, those kinds of things could be looked at. That's very interesting. And, and, and um, indeed, insulin was, uh, the pathway was, was related to, was shown to be related to cold tolerance. We did ch check some mutants there, but it could be some mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Luisa, do you want to answer the one you're typing in? What about the physiological regulation of MIO1 that presumably supports homeostasis from Ryan Bo? Oh, you're muted. I was indeed preparing uh, an answer for that one, but it might be easier this way. So uh, in C. elegans, we don't know. In other systems, MIR1 is known to be, so first of all, it's under transcription control of the classic muscle transcription factors. Um, HLH1 in, in C. elegans, we think is, is the one, but otherwise um, MEF2 and uh, SRF, so classic muscle transcription factors. But then on top of that, there has been proposed to be regulation by mTOR. So this is very intriguing because of course, the ATPase uh, is required for mTOR signaling. So this could somehow close a loop where MIR1 regulates the VATPase and VATPase regulates mTOR. And, um, and we know that there's effects from, in, so there's differences in starved versus fed worms. So this is something definitely to, to look further into. We don't have, yeah, tight answer, but that's that would be uh, where I would look. Great. Okay, final Great. question for Emily, if you can do it in one minute before we get shut off. Um, are there uh, microsporidial species, are they like specific, uh, specific but different nematode species or do they infect multiple species? Yeah, absolutely. There appears to be some tropism for specific species. Um, and this is actually Aaron Renke and Robert Llewellyn are doing some nice work with this, trying to understand, you know, which cases, um, which species will infect different, different worms. So the, the genera that I mentioned, there's a not perfect, but pretty close correlation between like the Matacida infecting C. neuroditis and then the Enterosectra infecting Oshias. So that's really the predominant groups of host Oshias and C. neuroditis that, that um, has been studied. So yeah, lots, lots of cool work going on there. Yep. All right, well, we have to end. So we're gonna wrap up the session now. Thanks so much to all of you guys, all speakers, introducers. Thanks to the attendees for all of your many questions. So the next events coming up are parallel sessions, which begin at noon Eastern Standard Time. 
And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the meeting. See you soon. Thank you, Jason. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks again. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.